Welcome to the first episode of Mine and Salvatore Polisi's podcast. The name of our podcast is A Lifetime of Mafia Tales. In this episode, Sal goes into depth of first being exposed to the Mafia. He takes us back to the year 1965 and how powerful the Mafia was at the time. The year 1965 is when Sal really started to get exposed to the Mafia. Sal had an uncle named Anthony Polisi who was a member of the Profaci crime family, which would later become known as the Colombo crime family. His uncle Anthony exposed Sal to lots of members of the Mafia at a young age. Sal's father was a member of the Profaci family as well, so Sal was essentially born into the Mafia. But enough from me, let's get into Sal's story. Hey everyone, welcome to our first episode of mine and Sal's new podcast. He's going to talk about his Mafia stories and what he did while he was growing up today we're going to go into the we're going to go back into 1965 and sal is going to give a, br a brief history of what it what was going on at that time what the mafia was like around that time and just daily life back in 1965 so let's uh go into that sal okay <clears throat> in the summer of 1965 i was 20 years old i had just got discharged from the United States Marine Corps. Um, and it was an interesting, interesting time for me because I had a sister that died a month after I was discharged in June of 1965. And then my brother, about six or eight weeks later, who was 16 years old, he drowned. So I was pretty uh, emotional about things. But in those days, Italians weren't allowed to show their emotions when you had a death in the family. So I had to bury all that and try to escape. I didn't do drugs. I didn't drink. But what I did do is uh, I went to my uncle Tony, Anthony Polisi's hotel nightclub that he had in Queens and hung out there. Uh, little did I know that it was a favorite spot of mafia guys, especially uh, really in those days, unknown Sonny Francis, who was a, captain in the Colombo crime family. At that time, uh, Franzese was hanging out in my uncle's hotel. My uncle had a bookmaking operation where he would take gambling bets. And he sort of introduced me to what was going on. Uh, again, in those days, everything was very secretive. The mob was secretive. Uh, gambling was so illegal that you could be arrested for just carrying a uh, a sports sheet showing what games were going to be played and what what the horse uh, horse lineup at the Aqueduct Racetrack, which was just a block away from my uncle's hotel. So it was a favorite spot for gamblers, favorite spot for mob guys, and mostly Italians were uh, would frequent that place. Mm -hmm. In that summer of '65, although the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, and Bob Dylan were hot. That music was not played in my uncle's nightclub. The only thing that was played in my uncle's nightclub was Italian favorites by Sinatra, Dean Martin, and uh, other Italian singers. So, uh, you know, I was accustomed to hearing this ethnic music. And this is what the landscape was like. I mean, 1965 was was a time when gasoline was 30 cents a gallon and uh, <laughs> things were inexpensive. And yeah. the mob the mob took $2 bets in those days. I mean, a $2 bet was considered a bet. So <laughs> inflation was, uh, it was really little or no inflation. That didn't come for another 10 years. Mm -hmm. But my position there was to help my uncle uh, run his nightclub. I mean, I went down to the, to the basement of the, uh, hotel that he had the name of the nightclub was the silver dollar uh nightclub and he taught me how to switch out whiskey and scotch and put the cheap whiskey and scotch in the expensive bottles so <laughs> Uncle tony was a scammer a schemer and uh he could make a hand look like a foot he was an interesting guy he dressed sharp wore a pinky diamond ring and always had a pile of money a roll of money in each pocket Damn. So I was introduced to that. And, you know, for that, he gave me a little room upstairs in the hotel and probably 20, 30, 40 bucks a week spend money. But again, in those days, there was penny candy and, a, and it was a nickel Hershey bar, not $2. <laughs> so things were pretty inexpensive. That's yeah. the beginning of my introduction to the mob. 
Yeah. So, I mean, it was a completely a whole different time, a whole different era, of course. I mean, you know, you think gas now is like five bucks a gallon and everything right. like that has just went up. But yeah, I mean, you, I'll go ahead. It's interesting to see the difference in where we are, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, who would have ever thought that we would have legal gambling and in, in, the, yep. in 2023, <laughs> uh, all kinds of legal marijuana. I mean, none of this stuff was legal. No, so it was illegal and it was very secretive. Mm -hmm. Life was very, very different. I had no idea where I was going with it, but I learned quickly. Mm -hmm. And I the learned. government, that the government, they made their money off of it. So, you know, right. they figured, you know, we, either these guys make all the money or we do. Right. <laughs> well, you know, little by little in, in New York, the mob from the 60s, the 70s, and the 80s, uh, the government started to take away certain things from the mob, like gambling. Well, they opened up off-track betting, OTB, and eventually uh, there was very little gambling by the mob, although some guys liked the illegal part of it. Yeah. And eventually, you know, you had lotto and gambling, and <clears throat> I mean, it was just a different time, uh, the 60s. Mm -hmm. And you're, uh, <clears throat> I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but your father and your uncle were both bootleggers for the Profaci crime family? Yes, my uncle was, uh, I think he was born in 1909, 1910. So by the late 20s, I think it was my uncle and my father would drive a horse and wagon from Brooklyn out to eastern Long Island to meet the boats that came from Canada and, and smuggle in the booze. Uh, they Damn. were bootleg, bootlegging, bootlegging drivers. That's what they did. So then you said they were driving on a horse and a wagon back then. Horse and a wagon, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Wow, that's that's early 1900s or even before then. Oh, it was the 1920s during the prohibition. 1920s. Yeah, Pro prohibition. You know, like okay. I think up until uh, 32 or 33 when they repealed the mm. uh, the alcohol ban in the country. Uncle Tony and my father would bring the uh, bring the booze to Brooklyn, and eventually my grandfather opened up a little small bar restaurant after, after the illegal booze was, was again legal. So the family was always involved in restaurants and, and alcohol. And as a kid growing up, I heard these stories. Uncle Tony was, he was a swashbuckling guy. This is a guy who could trade. I mean, he was a, he was a real estate guy. I mean, he would trade anything. He was a good trader. I kind of learned some of those tricks of, of, of the mob life and how he, he bought and sold all kinds of stolen merchandise. This is what he did. So I learned that stuff from him. So he was very influential to you back in the day. What about your father? Was he around much, or did he give you any tricks of the trade like like him? No, he he uh, eventually uh, swayed away from from the Brooklyn guys. He didn't get along with Uncle Tony. Uncle Tony was flamboyant, and uh, you know a lot of people were jealous of him or resentful of him. So. Um, I got to see that inside part of Uncle Tony with the mob guys and all. Uh, you know, they were all hanging out in this nightclub. This Sonny Franzese had a whole group of guys, his mob crew at that time, a bunch of vicious killers, uh, but nobody knew what they were doing. Everything was very secretive. And eventually uh, Uncle Tony and Sonny Franzese in the late 60s got arrested for bank robbery and they both went to jail. Hmm. And this was... The one because Sonny got picked up a few times for for the bank robberies and stuff right. like that. But this was one of the first earlier cases, or was this that was the original bank robbery case where uh, my uncle Tony was arrested and considered the uh, the head of the uh, bank robbery ring, and then eventually Sonny Francis was convicted. My uncle got uh, fifteen years, but eventually he he was uh, he won his case and got released on an appeal. But Sonny Francis managed to stay in jail in and out for 50 years. Yeah, he so did. <laughs> I think Always. the government really framed Sonny Francis, to be honest. Well, yeah, I mean, you see the videos with, like, Michael Francis. I mean, he truly believes that his father was framed as well because... I mean, there's just so much that goes into it. But, you know, this is what I always I've been telling, you know, other guys that I interview and that, you know, that they were in prison and stuff, you know, and they say that they're wrongfully convicted. It's like, you know, you give the government, you know, you pose for that picture, like for them to just put this case on you because, oh, you're this mobster, you're this gangster, you commit all these crimes. It's like, well, you know what, it's making it just so much easier for 
for anybody just to say, well, you know, yeah, he probably did it, but it might not be the case, you know. In that summer of 65, I clearly remember uh, three or four guys that were hanging out in my uncle's hotel. They later became uh, witnesses against Sonny Franzese, uh, a guy named Zayer, Parks, Cadero, Smith. These guys were bank robbers, but they were also drug users, drug addicts mm -hmm. in those days. So eventually the government flipped them. They testified and they put, uh, you know, Sonny Franzese in jail for 50 years. I actually went to the court, uh, Brooklyn court, federal court, and watched some of that case that my uncle was uh, on. Eventually he went to, to jail. By that time, the following year, year and a half later, I had learned all about bookmaking. So I uh, started this bookmaking operation. And what, what did that look look like or consist of? How did you even uh, attempt to start, you know, becoming a bookmaker? Well, I had uh, I had pulled off my own little score, had about thirty, forty thousand dollars. In those days, that was a lot of money, <clears throat> and I managed to purchase a small little pizza joint, uh, which was only five minutes from my uncle's uh, hotel, which later he later he had closed. And I ran this little pizza joint. The name of it was Sal's Pizza, similar <laughs> to Spike's movie, I think. But this was before Spike Lee's movie. And I used to take $2 bets. And I learned how to, uh, how to gamble. Eventually, while my uncle was in jail, um, there was a guy that he was in jail with that I didn't really understand the, the background. But his name was Dominic Cataldo, Little Dom, who later became a hitman for the Columbos. Well, his family and my family went back to the 1920s. So when Little Dom came out of jail, he came to my little pizza joint, and we expanded our gambling operation. That's how I got involved with Little Dom from the uh, Com Colombo crime family. Oh, okay. And that's when it just kept going and going. So even before you were doing all this stuff, I mean, you really, <clears throat> before 1965, you were already doing crimes. But because you came out of the, the Marines, you said 19... 65 but you were 20 some years old 21 or 20 20 yeah 20 okay so even before that were you doing any crimes or committing anything like that or doing yeah i pulled off a couple of little scams i pulled off a forgery scam which was uh, virtually very easy in those days because you know credit cards there was uh, no authorization for credit cards uh checks you could take a check and go into a bank if you could forge the person's signature it didn't have any cameras. There was no security in, in the 60s. So I ripped off about 30000 from a guy's account, went back and told my uncle I had this money. He said, okay, let's go buy this little pizza joint, and we'll have a, a gambling operation. Uh, little did I know it was across the street from Fat Andy Reggiano's house. I mean, it was right in the same neighborhood. Of, it was a half a block away. I didn't understand, you know, who was who in those days, but... There was something about Fat Andy. He didn't like me. He didn't like Little Dom. But he couldn't do much about Little Dom and Cataldo because uh, the Colombo guys, Colombo guys liked Cataldo. He was sort of protected. Right. So in es essence, I was sort of protected by the Colombos. I was never really involved deeply with uh, Fat Andy or the Gambinos. But later on, I learned who was who uh, years later after uh, after the, the uh, South Pizza uh joint pizza operation for gambling oh okay so did he ever come in the the pizza shop or anything Ruggiano? No, no he didn't come in but albert reggiano and anthony reggiano were both like younger than me and they would come in and get a slice of pizza i knew them as little kids oh, little okay. did we know 50 years later they were going to be you know anthony was going to be involved uh, you know, doing podcasts. It's hilarious to me. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I know, man. I've interviewed him. He's he's a good guy. He's a good storyteller too, man. Just like you. A lot of you a lot of you uh, you know, ex mob guys are just, you know, perfect at telling stories and people love hearing them. Man. Yeah. You call that a mafia raconteur. How do you how you say it? Oh, the raconteur. <laughs> yeah. I don't think I ever heard the name until a woman in Las Vegas was a writer and she interviewed me. She was Jewish woman from new york and she said you went from being a racketeer to a raconteur i go what's a raconteur she says you're a great storyteller that's what she said 
Well, you are, man, and people are interested in the stories and stuff. But, yeah. you know, I, I suppose going back to, you know, 1965, what else was going on at the time or what other key events happened? Well, I mean, you know, secretly, you got to understand how secret the mob was in those days. Uh, there was no <clears throat> there was no reports of inner workings. And it was very hush hush. Uh, it was sort of like you couldn't recognize someone who was a, a made member, they wouldn't come out and say it, you know, so and it was just different. It was very different. Uh, you had to have this deep connection with one person, and then you could be introduced to another person. It virtually took years to work your way up, you know, uh, in the family. Of course, it was uh, maybe five, six, seven years later that I had gotten involved with a couple of the Gambino guys. But you know, there was also a war. There was always a Columbo war going on. And unfortunately, <laughs> I was part of that Columbo group. Uh, yeah, it was just a different time. It was very I, exciting. I for, it was exciting for me, though. Was there any, what, what war, would there have been a war in 1965? Because I know there was the Profaci and then the Joey Gallo one. I'm not sure on the exact years, but in 1965, were the other were the other two I, going on? I think it was the quiet, secretive factions, different parts of the family that were that were struggling. Whether it was crazy uh, Joe Gallo, or <laughs> I mean, there was you know a lot going on in the late 60s mm -hmm. with other families also. So they were all jockeying for space and control. And you had to learn this about the mob. There were certain things that uh, you had to understand how the workings of, of the control that the mob had in unions and trucking and garbage. I mean, people just didn't realize how much power uh, the New York mob had in the, on the streets of New York in the 60s and 70s. It was very, very quiet. But, you know, each family had a little spot. They had their own little control of certain uh, illegal operations. Mm -hmm. And in the 1960s, what uh, area did the Colombo family control? Do you know? Like well, the because they got hard, yeah, that was hard. It's hard to say because they were all over the city, mm -hmm. so they had little pockets of of operations going on, mostly gambling. No one ever admitted to drug dealing in those days. It was very very quiet, <laughs> and you weren't supposed to deal drugs. I always had the thought that from the top down the heads of the families they don't want anybody dealing drugs because they were secretly doing it themselves <laughs> they didn't want competition from the underlings from right the, from the and guys that could that be were, very well true yeah you know I, mean? I had that feeling yeah there was bosses that got busted uh vito genovese carmine right. galante right I mean, these were i know vito was the main boss but carmine you know he was trying to become the boss of the bonanno right. family i mean he was a capo but i mean yeah there was heavily influenced guys that were involved with selling drugs. I mean, they even say Lucky Luciano and stuff, but I mean, I don't know if there's physical proof or he was never arrested or convicted for that. So, I mean, there's a lot of theories and stuff out there, but yeah. there's, a, I mean, but the guys that did get convicted like them too, they, uh, I mean, it's true. It's out there that there was guys secretly dealing in this stuff and you're right. They probably didn't want competition from the under, underlings, you know, <laughs> From, from the beginning in 65, when I saw these mob guys, how they dressed and how they handled themselves, I think I actually wanted to become a mob member from 65. But by the time I went to jail and got out of jail, which was 75, a lot had taken place. I started to think, uh oh, this is not the way to be. But you couldn't openly say that you realize the mob was really a secret type of a cult organization where you put the mafia above your family. But mm -hmm. I started to feel it because there was a lot of murders going on uh, that just really, you know, took away the, the inner part of the excitement of, of the mob because you could easily get killed for no, almost no reason. But mm -hmm. by the time the 70s came, so early on in the 60s, yeah, I was influenced. I thought it was flamboyant. I thought it was exciting. Much like a rock star, you know, a rock star sees or a future rock star sees this excitement of somebody becoming famous. And then you think it's glorious. But as you get down the road, the closer you get to the star, the less it really illuminates. It doesn't shine like you think it 
it, it, it was going to. So right. in, in 10 or 15 years, my whole opinion of the mob had changed. Unfortunately, I wasn't really going to spit it up, you know, and say, hey, look, I'm done with this life. It's a life for losers. You're only going to get killed. Yeah, there's a lot of money around. But I slowly backed away, but it took about 10 years. So from 65 to 75, I was deep. And all that went into hanging out with other mobsters, I'm sure we're going to get into with all these other episodes. Because when my uncle went to jail for bank robbery, I'd go to sleep at night thinking and dreaming, oh, I'm going to rob a bank one day. <laughs> 1965. Well, we'll get to the part in 1970, 71, when I actually did go rob a bank. Mm -hmm. And and unfortunately, um, the mob, they didn't like bank robbers. The mafia guys didn't like bank robbers because there was no way for them to make money off a bank robber. (laughs) No, they would. I mean, the only way that they'd get it is if someone kicked up, right? Yeah, yeah, if you did that. But a lot of bank (laughs) robbers were were sort of individuals. They were like... Mm -hmm. Like, you know, Mavericks. They were out there by themselves. Oh. And I didn't do that until 71. We got a lot of ground to cover between 65 and 71. But it was a, a fantasy of mine, you know. Right. And I thought it was exciting. And, of course, in those days, in the 60s and 70s, there was nothing in banks. There was money in banks. There was no credit card being used, no cameras, no security. So eventually I got to figure out how I could – rob a bank and we'll get to that part but i'm sure yeah. that's down down the road the 60s yeah. were interesting for me it was an introduction to the mob and my uncle tony was he was a sharp character and he had introduced me actually to this dominic catalgo so that's how i got involved with gambling mm-hmm. in, in the late 60s yeah and, and i mean that's what i'm saying so with all, all of our episodes that we're going to be doing everyone that's watching you know we're going to go into sal's life and section it off and go into different details about different stories. We'll go into major depth about everything. I mean, cause he has so many more stories. Gotti with John Gotti, Gene Gotti, you know, <laughs> the five oh, yeah. guys, Sinatra yeah. club. So we got, we, we got a lot of ground to cover, but yeah. this episode is just strictly just going into your introduction to the mafia. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It so, was pretty exciting though. I mean, to tell you, to, you had to back away and be very quiet and just observe. And you could see these guys. They had this body language that they dressed in these fancy suits with pinky rings and drove Lincolns and Cadillacs. So I was very, very impressed at 20. Yeah, I would imagine because if you're seeing all this, and especially, you know, if your family's involved with that and you see them all flashy business owners and making all this kind of money, having fun. I mean, for a young kid, that's like, be crazy not to to want to do it. I mean, that's what you think. Right. And then, yeah, I mean, like you said, later you find out, oh, hell, I don't want to be in this no more. <laughs> but yeah. what, what else kind of drew you to wanting to pursue that life? What else stood out to you? Well, it was really the way the average person or other people, you know, looked at Uncle Tony with a great deal of admiration and respect. And of course, the same with mob guys. I mean, it's sort of. You know, the people, the Italian people, not just the Italians in New York, they sort of knew who a guy like Sonny Franzese was. They didn't know the detail of what his life really, you know, was about. But they had respect and fear. Uh, basically, um, people were jealous of of Italian guys who had money and, and they drove fancy cars and had pretty women. So... Yeah, you could see that this was the way of life that you could easily get drawn into. Yeah, and like with like what you said too as well. I mean, these guys, the Italian community, I suppose, was uh, when they first came here. They were, I mean, obviously, you know, they're going to be poorer, and that's what pursued the mafia and stuff, kind of right. I mean, that's why people wanted to join the mafia. They wanted to earn some good money that wasn't just you know, dirt poor struggling their whole life. So they started doing their own uh, operations and that's how it just kept going and going for all these years. And then what, uh, I mean, for your, for your, your father and your uncle is what was their scenario? I mean, why did they want to join the mafia? Was it because they were poor like that? My uncle realized that the influence that mob guys had, uh, that wasn't openly spoke about influence, whether it be political or business-wise, and he was able to interact with these guys. I mean, he had different talents. Uh, 
Uncle Tony was, uh, you could speak fluent Italian, but he also could speak Yiddish. Really? Yeah, he could, he hung out with a lot of Jewish guys, and Jewish guys had, you know, influence with money. I mean, mm -hmm. they were never the, you know, the muscle uh, in the mob, not that much. But he was able to interact with them. And hmm. so he always made money legally and illegally. So uh, it was exciting to watch him. I mean, he drove fancy cars, had great, you know, great looking women around him, even though he was married. Uh, <laughs> I, my uncle was not, he did not, um, he did not have any barriers when it came to, 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 to business when it came to legal business and also he mixed the le illegal part i mean when I, he was i was a little kid he took me to crap games much like uh the movie that Chaz palmo Thierry did bronx tale bronx tale i mean i could look at that and i remember a little kid going to these crap games in factories rolling dice on the floor i mean <laughs> i actually lived this so i laughed when i saw those scenes with Chaz palmo Thierry, you know Mm -hmm. uh, but he was he was quite a gambler. Uncle Tony was a big time gambler, and took me to the racetrack, uh, teaching me how to bet horses and how to how to get involved with illegal gambling. So there was always a way to make money. Illegal gambling uh, was not really considered a crime to mob guys in those days. It was a vice, you know. It was yeah. like okay, and then it was shylocking loan loaning money at outrageous rates you know to other gamblers so there was sort of a quiet side to crime that wasn't really violent violent crime the violent yeah. crime was really done by a small percentage of mob guys you mm -hmm. had to get involved with someone who was connected to get uh, to get deeply entrenched in like beating people up killing people i mean this was something that was going on I mean, even from the beginning, I was never in favor of killing anybody. Hey, thanks for watching this clip. This clip came from our Patreon channel. The name of our podcast is A Lifetime of Mafia Tales. Me and Sal's podcast is all about his life in the Mafia. Salvatore was a Colombo associate. Salvatore, also known as Sally Ubats, has many stories about committing crimes with all five of the New York crime families, such as hijacking, bank robberies, heists, and much more. Sal has many criminal stories about him and other high-ranking mobsters such as John Gotti, Peter Gotti, Gene Gotti, Jimmy Burke, Angelo Ruggiero, Henry Hill, Dave Icavetti Sr., Tommy DeSimone, Dominic Cataldo, Joe Brancato, and many more. During his time as a mobster, he had a social club he opened called the Sinatra Club. He would later go on to write a book and a movie about his time in the Sinatra Club. Sal has a lot of untold stories about John Gotti that people haven't heard. And as myself, my name is Adrian Martinez. I've been doing a podcast for the last two years. It's called Invest in Yourself Podcast. I've done a number of mafia interviews the last few years. I've done interviews with mafia associates, made men, and capos, also known as bosses. Salvatore and I have decided to partner up to start our own podcast to drop some new untold stories about the mafia. Please subscribe to mine and Sal's Patreon account to watch all of our full exclusive videos about Sal's life in the mafia. The link to subscribe to our Patreon channel is in the video description below.